Hello and welcome to Taiwan Talks. I'm Ian Kavat. Is a similar form of escalation by China happening off Vietnam's waters as off Philippine waters, except that Hanoi chooses to keep the incidents off the international radar? At the beginning of July, China appeared to be holding a rare twin carrier exercise in the South China Sea with the Shandong aircraft carrier and at least eight warships, according to satellite imagery. They were also spotted about 50 miles northeast of Woody Island in the Paracels, which were partly held by Vietnam until China seized all of them in a naval battle in 1974. Taiwan also claims the territory. China's The Monster Coast Guard ship has several times this year patrolled Vietnam's oil fields in the Spratlys, most recently in June. And in March 2024, China redrew its coastal baseline in the Gulf of Tonkin between Vietnam and China. <laughs> this diverges from an agreement reached by Hanoi and Beijing in the year 2000. How is Vietnam handling these moves by China? And will it take a stronger stance toward its more powerful neighbor? We also take a look at cooperation between Vietnam and the Philippines and whether the two South China Sea claimants can stand together against Beijing's increasingly assertive behavior. Joining us today are Alexander Huang, Chair of the Council on Strategic Wargaming Studies and Guomingdang International Affairs Director, and Hun Tam Seng, Ho Chi Minh City University of Social Sciences and Humanities, Faculty of International Relations Lecturer. And he's a National Taiwan University Visiting Scholar. Very warm welcome to both of you on the show today. In March this year, Beijing released a set of seven points forming a baseline which defines its sovereignty in the waters shared with Vietnam. The Gulf of Tonkin lies between China's Hainan Island and Vietnam's northeastern coast. The move serves to alter the demarcations agreed between Hanoi and Beijing in 2000. This year, Beijing said it could redraw straight lines as its baseline. However, this feature is reserved under UNCLOS, the UN law of the sea, only for archipelagic states of which China is not. So let's take a look at the significance of a baseline. Here we have the 12 nautical mile uh, territorial sea followed by the contiguous zone up to 24 nautical miles and the exclusive economic zone. What's the motivation, do you think, behind China's move? Uh, because an extension uh, of the baseline, uh, because the baseline can be drawn in curved line or straight line between the base point, according to the United Nations Convention of Law of the Sea. Uh, the Chinese decided to draw the straight line and expanded uh, the water uh, as the inner water as defined by the law. Uh, in reality, it expanded the waters that under uh, the Chinese sovereign control. Mm. And further, it can extend it, the territorial waters from the baseline for 12 nautical miles and 24 nautical miles from the baseline as the contiguous zone. Uh, the reason um, could be uh, a more, a larger uh, sea area for the Chinese Navy's uh, operations uh, or exercise. Uh, another point is that <clears throat> that China can have a, a bigger voice in terms of dealing with Vietnam in, on the issue of offshore uh, you know, exploitation of gas and uh, oil. Um, that had been um, a, a quarrel between Vietnam and the PRC for decades. Uh, and uh, we did not know uh, the true reason why they wanted to do it now Maybe uh, the Chinese is becoming more powerful or they think they have a better tool to, inf uh, to implement uh, the, their territorial claim. Uh, definitely it brings uh, a more uh, difficult challenges to the entire region in the South China Sea. Mm. Professor um, Hun, China is just simply more powerful. They can do whatever they want. I think the reason is that uh, China has been growing more powerful However, with the baseline, it has been illegal. And we know that Article 7 includes the phrase, uh, the raw wing of a strange baseline uh, must, go, must not depart to any appreciable extent from the general direction of the cost. 
But it's very clear from the maps that trying a new space line depart considerably from the general direction of the cost. And in my opinion, the new space line would bring a lot of complication to uh, other marine time activities in the areas, such as the freedom of navigation activities, scientific research, and even the island's reclamation work. And the new space line um, declaration could also be a considered to be an early test of a much larger enclosures. We know that in uh, 2022, the Chinese government announced that this has encircled uh, the waters of four Chinese occupied islands. At that time, the United States did not uh, comply, just agree with the new baseline, and it decided to uh, conduct, a, uh, conduct freedom of navigation operation in the, the, the region to challenge China activities there. Mm. Yeah, and it leads into my, um, my next question, which was going to be, can China unilaterally change the baseline? The reason China wants to uh, make a shock of fair accompli, and when saying a fair accompli, it means a thing that's accomplished and reciprocally irreversible. Mm. However, uh, Vietnam has not endorsed China's new baseline. Hmm. Okay, so, so to summarize it, in terms of the impacts on, on, on Vietnam and other countries. The real issue is whether uh, to draw a straight line uh, between the base point is acceptable. Mm. As Professor Huyong has said, uh, China may want to create a, a fait accompli. Mm. And so uh, if international community does not make a big noise or there is no power uh, intervention to force China to change back its claim, then uh, over time it will become a reality. Right. Um, and that, like that brings to... Zone. That brings to uh, the attitude of the Vietnamese government, yes. whether they wanted to uh, really l make their voice louder. I, exactly. So, Professor Hoon, is there appetite for that in Hanoi? Um, I think the Hanoi government has been really skeptical about China's ambition. And on those, uh, the Hanoi government, they decided to keep a low real price on these issues, but they they didn't want to uh, like, um, antagonize China. And uh, we know that back into 2010, uh, Chinese then Prime Minister uh, Yang Chia Tzu, uh, he said that China is a big country and other countries are small country, and it's in effect. And if regional country, especially Clement State in the South China Sea, uh, they don't voice <coughs> a vocal um, uh, aggression against some um, shock up misbehaviors from China, but in this instance, um, Professor Hoon, so it seems that it's quite black and white, isn't it? I mean, the UNCLOS allows archipelagic states to draw straight baselines, but China does not qualify as an archipelagic state. So I guess what I'm saying is that Vietnam would have the backing, surely, of the United Nations itself. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but the reason is that Vietnam uh, quite, quite contrary to the Philippines. So in terms of strategic location, uh, Hainan Island, next to the Gulf of Tonkin, is a Chinese military base. Reports say to defend Hainan Island, Beijing hopes to expand the area for detecting attacks, um, as you can see in this map. So, Alex, if we come back to you, uh, how significant is Hainan Island for China? Well, Hainan Island uh, is um, very important because uh, the, uh, it only, uh, not only carries the, the largest naval base for the um, uh, Chinese aircraft carrier, but also it's a very important base for uh, the Chinese uh, nuclear submarines. Uh, as we all know that, um, that uh, Hainan uh, bases, naval station, uh, it's important because uh, if the Allied forces or the United States and other forces wanted to uh, travel uh, from the Philippine Sea uh, through the southern tip of Taiwan and then getting into the South China Sea. And, 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 the, and the Hainan Island is, is at the pivotal position to project its force. Um, that's why I think that the redraw of the baseline uh, had implied that China wanted to have a larger area that can be projected from the island of Highland and, and make sure that it has a wider water space 
for their naval and air forces to do regular exercise and also uh, uh, provide China with a what we call the strategic depth um, and keep the adversary further away from the island. Hainan Island uh, is pivotal to China's power projection into the South China Sea. Mm. And as you said, if more islands can actually be um, absorbed by mm -hmm. that changing baseline, then that, that affords even more, even greater power projection. Right. Um, Professor Hoon, one analyst, this is picking up on one of your, your themes from before, Vietnam's approach in comparison to the Philippines. So one analyst has termed Vietnam's strategy as uh, the opacity initiative uh, in contrast to the Philippines' transparency or assertive transparency. What's your view? Um, I would like to talk a little bit more about the overall framework of Vietnam foreign policy. So the design of Vietnam modern uh, foreign policy is typically rustic in historical experiences. We know that Vietnam was occupied by China for 3,000 years, and then we have the uh, foreign colonialism and the war with the United States. So the experiences have typically informed Vietnam work views and Vietnam's sharp engagement on the basis that uh, nothing should uh, impede its uh, national independence and sovereignty. And uh, today, the, the most important thing for the Vietnamese leaders is to maintain the stability of the Vietnam foreign policy and maintain an environment that is conducive for economic growth. Mm -hmm. So uh, Vietnam has been maintaining a low profile in the South China Sea. As made very clear, it four knows uh, policy. The first one is no military alliance. And the second is no alliance with one country to counter the another countries. Mm -hmm. The third one is no military base in Vietnamese soil. And the fourth is no threatening to use force in interna international relations. But if we just consider the Four Nose policy, we can miss one point, very important. This is one dependence, and depends on the case on the ground. Vietnam will force the relationship with country, especially great power, to counter any activities or any behaviors that can be harmful to its sovereign state and national independence. And uh, there is no reason that Vietnam should challenge China in the South China Sea, because what we value is the stability in the relationship and if uh, the, the case in the South China Sea become hostile, are there some uh, uh, re between Vietnam and China in the South China Sea? It's not conducive for Vietnam economic growth anymore. Mm. But, but does there come a point at which that strategy doesn't make sense any longer in that China keeps pushing and pushing and pushing the envelope? Yes. And uh, because we have the, the, the shock of asymmetric relationship between China and Vietnam, China has been growing more powerful. And when we consider the military capabilities, economic capabilities, and other resources between uh, China and, and Vietnam, we can see the clear disparity here. And there's no way that Vietnam should challenge China in the South China Sea. However, Vietnam has been trying to foster a web of relationship with other regional powers like Japan, South Korea. Australia and even uh, India, and especially with the United States, uh, to keep a shock of hatching in its foreign policy. Mm. Alex, I want to get your view um, on this on this strategy. Well, apparently, um, it is right to describe that the, the Vietnamese policy toward uh, the Chinese expansion in the South China Sea had been a little bit opaque uh, compares to. Uh, other countries like the Philippines. Uh, Vietnam did not bring any uh, territorial uh, or demarcation cases to the uh, international tribunal or arbitrary course, uh, court. I, I think um, you know, we need to understand that, uh, that uh, uh, both Vietnam and China share the land border, number one. Number two, uh, Beijing had maintained a specific relationship with Hanoi. And number three, uh, the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, has just visited Vietnam as well. So if we bring this case and uh, put it on a larger map of the Russia, China, uh, and Southeast Asia uh, as a whole, 
then the issue become more complicated uh, and uh, needs to be exam or, or be uh, discussed uh, from a wider angle rather than looking at the legality of this straight line or curved line um, that China had newly declared. Mm, okay. Now, meanwhile, in June, the Philippines submitted a claim to the UN to define its outer continental shelf boundary, seeking recognition of its rights outside its EEZ in the South China Sea. Both Vietnam and the Philippines have said they are willing to hold talks on a solution between the two states. Why does this affect Vietnam on the other side of the South China Sea? And why do, and I'll come to Professor Wang for this, why do both country, uh, countries have overlapping claims? I think the uh, Hanoi and Manila have overlapping claim to feature in the Spratly Iceland. And, uh, but however, the incidents between the two countries have been really rare, while bilateral ties were strained during Russian Marcos visit to Vietnam earlier this year, and the two countries also agreed to uh, increase collaboration, especially in terms of Coast Guard uh, cooperation. And I think that the relationship is quite uh, going on very well. Uh, on those, we have some shock of overlapping claim to uh, some features in the sea. Mm. Okay, um, but essentially what we're talking about is Vietnam also claiming the Spratleys. Uh, so does this go beyond their actual economic, uh, the 200 nautical mile EEZ? Um, the claim of Vietnam in, in the South China Sea is, has been, according to the Vietnamese government, has been a legal in terms of unglass and most of the benefits that Vietnam is trying to achieve the economic resources and the uh, shipping areas for its fishermen. Mm. Alex, would you, would you like to comment on that? Well, all the claimants to the uh, Spratlys or the South China Sea Of which Taiwan uh, islands, obviously is Yeah, well. uh, all claimants uh, uh, expressed that they wanted to uh, uh, follow the peaceful use of the resources, that they wanted to share uh, the interests and resources together. But uh, the, the cold reality is that uh, the physical strength and national wealth uh, are behind those claims. Uh, and we cannot pretend that we don't understand that. It will be up to the claimants to calculate their own interests and see which country has a bigger influence and power to define their own territorial claim. So are you saying that might is right in the South China Sea? Uh, to, to be true, yes, it is. So, so I, I think the Philippines understand that. Uh, Hanoi also understand that. Um, no matter it's a high profile uh, you know, court event or a low profile uh, private communication, I think nations will try to find their own ways to protect and maximize their national interests as much as possible. Mm. So are you also agreeing with Professor Hoon then that there is no point in Hanoi trying to push back on China? I think probably China. Hanoi understand that uh, to make the, to, to do fireworks it may, may not help their true national interests. Probably. Uh, you know, a closed door conversation uh, or debate or argument uh, can best serve their interests. Professor Hoon, you mentioned about the cooperation between Vietnam and the Philippines. Obviously, there was a lot of activity following, as you said, Marcus's visit, Ferdinand Marcus Jr., the Philippine president's visit to Hanoi in January this year. Um, how do you think China views their cooperation? Is, is that seen as a threat to China? Uh, I don't think the Chinese government, they, they were really happy about the collaboration between the Philippines and Vietnam. However, they have uh, some shock of tolerance for the Philippines and Vietnam because in the eyes of the leaders in Beijing, the Philippines and Vietnam are just a smaller power, the, the middle powers in the region, and there's no way that they can uh, collaborate to challenge China in the South China Sea. And especially we have some shock of uh, shortcomings in the South China Sea like uh, Hanoi has been really measured and less vocal in uh, uh, these ways that uh, is uh, faced Beijing in the South China Sea. We know that recently the state of the United States has been what I call the turbulence. They are trying to uh, diversify their relation, trying to 
uh, navigate tension in uh, the Ukraine, uh, Russia war, and others, uh, geographical tension in the Middle East. And there's no way that they can uh, engage more in the South China Sea. And with that in mind, I think the Chinese listeners, they have some shock of tolerance and do not worry too much about the cooperation between uh, the Philippines and Vietnam. Mm. So, so you're saying that you were, you were talking about the U.S. in terms of being sort of tied up <clears throat> with, the, with the Ukraine war. Yes. Right. Okay. So, so you believe that China thinks that they would not... Would not intervene to support the, uh, the ones, uh, the Philippines, the allies, strictly allies of the United States and Vietnam, the growing partner of, uh, the, of Washington. Right. So, so they don't think that the U.S. would step in. So yeah. That's a very, very interesting point. Alex, you uh, want to get... Yeah, the United order. States, uh, to my knowledge... Oh, obviously, they, they don't want conflict, uh, but... The, yeah, but the United States had uh, stepping up uh, their uh, dialogue and activities uh, with, uh, between the United States forces and the Philippines, for short, because we talk about those uh, quite a while. Uh, but also, the United States has not given up since uh, uh, the Bill Clinton's presidency. Uh, the United States continue to improve the relationship with the Vietnamese government. And uh, to my understanding that uh, security dialogue and uh, other form of senior level dialogue are uh, ongoing reality. So let's, um, for the final question, um, Professor Huon, let's, let's move to Vietnam's relations with Taiwan. Can you tell us how you see them evolving um, during the time that you've been researching? Um, I think the relationship between Taiwan and Vietnam is quite interesting. Uh, just for uh, around uh, 20 years ago, we see that the relationship has been not flourish as we see now. And with the growing economic benefits, Taiwan and Vietnam are are trying to foster the relationship. And we also see that with the influx of Vietnamese migrants worker in Vietnam, and they have contributed much to the development of Vietnam in terms of economic benefits. And some Vietnamese people, they also are trying to raise the status of Taiwan in international agenda. And I think the growing relationship is quite promising. However, there's some shortcoming, there's some setback that we should not um, uh, fail to, to, to hit there lie the mig Vietnamese migrants worker, we see there's some, some cases that they have been illegal or undocumented. And the relationship between Vietnam and Taiwan has been economic oriented rather than uh, multi-dimensions approach. Like if you ask some uh, Vietnamese people in Ho Chi Minh City, a metropolis in, 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 in Vietnam, they may confuse between China and Taiwan. And some people may say that Taiwan is a part of China or a province of China. It's so swear. Uh, so what I'm trying to say that the, the Taiwanese government, they should foster more cultural, foster some uh, multi-dimensional way to foster the relationship with Vietnam. Mm. So, so, so what other dimensions? There's the economic, obviously, they cannot be political. Uh, they, they can be educational ties, uh, light. Uh, there's a growing interest in Vietnam to learn uh, Chinese learn Mandarin, but learning it in Taiwan's because when they went to uh, China, so many people complained that they have been restricted by not using other shops of social media and other platforms like Google, and that's restricted. There's some shock of academic freedom. There's no way that you can talk about uh, the South China Sea and some hindrance between uh, China and Taiwan. Mm. So they opted to move to Taiwan to have more academic freedom to express their voice, to express their identity through the academic work. And I think this field of interest should be uh, the ways that the Taiwanese government should focus more. Mm. Okay, that's fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Thank you so much, Alexander Huang and Hun Tam Seng, for joining Taiwan Talks today. If you liked our show, please search for us on YouTube, give us a thumbs up and hit subscribe to our channel. Thank you for watching our show today. Stay safe. See you next time.
There are so many things that I wish the world could see. It is amazing to watch this captain maneuver this giant ship. It takes three days to cook this. The flavor is unbelievable, incredible. And it's my turn to make something inspired by Chef Gore. It's going to be quite a challenge. Can you imagine that? It's surreal. Yes, yeah, surreal. I can't give up. I got some ass kicking to do. Nice move. We're pushing each other to explore and experiment in new, different ways. Five, four, three, two. A warm welcome to Taiwan Plus News. Exploring the issues that matter to you. Not just to Taiwan, the whole world is watching. We might encounter mishaps and mistakes along the way. But at the end of the day, it just transmits something straight from the heart. Yes. <laughs> Cheers. Bon appetit. It is about the fun and it's about the glamour and it's also about something much deeper than that. Sometimes you just gotta seize the opportunity. You just gotta do it. place where you're appreciated for you exactly as you are and where you can shine and be seen. In the face of adversity, the power of truth. A roadmap for a just and open world, charted by the freest country in Asia. Taiwan Plus News, a voice of freedom in Asia.